I can't smile. I was born with a really rare neurological disorder called Nodia syndrome. And the syndrome is so rare that it only affects one individual in every three to four million. And around the age of, I want to say 11 or 12, I had a really invasive operation um, that was supposed to be able to make me smile. Obviously the outcome was to be able to make me smile, but it was unsuccessful. Getting the news, that was really heartbreaking on the day because you sort of thought, well, what's going to happen down the track? How will she progress? So this was the day that you were diagnosed with a condition, mm -hmm. and it was Friday, 13th of February. I was born with a really rare neurological disorder called Nodia syndrome. So it's basically like facial paralysis, um, and because of the syndrome, I was also born with an outer extremity deformity, and mine was bilateral talipes, or clubbed feet. And around the age of, I want to say, 11 or 12, I had a really invasive operation that was supposed to be able to make me smile, but it was unsuccessful. And um, getting the news, that was really heartbreaking on the day because you sort of thought, well, what's going to happen down the track? How will she progress? What will the teenage years be like? What will her young adult life be like? And all those sorts of things. So, mm. <laughs> so yeah, it was heartbreaking. Ugh. I think my confidence got knocked out of me as I got older. I didn't want to go anywhere because I was insecure about myself. But when it comes to physical bullying, it's like, um, it's tough. So, you know, like I was pushed down hills, I had my bag ripped off my back, had books ripped out of my bag. Um, I would get, like I'd be walking upstairs and people would kick my knees in from behind. You know, it was tough. Oh, of course it did. I would always look at people and be like, why can't I be them? Why can't I just be accepted like they are accepting everyone else? I first started the self-help journey around the age of 20. Um, that doesn't mean I fully accepted myself then, but um, it's been four years of me really working hard uh, in all aspects of my life to make sure I can live the best life I possibly can. When I started to own who I was and my appearance and everything about myself, my whole world opened up. And I'd st sort of started getting better at the beginning of 2017. I was contacted by someone from Parafed Auckland, which is the, like the Paralympic sort of body here in Auckland, and um, asked if I wanted to give athletics a go. And so I was like, sure, I won't be running anywhere, but <laughs> I'll throw something. <laughs> um, so they gave me a shot put and they said, just give it a go. So I threw it and they were like, wow, okay, you're pretty good. Um, and then they measured it and they were like, oh, you've just broken the New Zealand record in your classification. Where I competed and got my classification to compete internationally and also became world number one in my classification um, by competing there, which was just incredible. Being an athlete has given me so much discipline and strength and confidence and it's really set me up um, and I think it really helped in terms of my recovery journey. Oh, everything's changed since accepting myself. My confidence, the way I interact with people, the way I interact with people online, being 100% authentic to me. Like, I'm probably one of the most sarcastic people you'll ever meet. Gosh. I know. It is so hard being ridiculously offensively attractive. Like, I get it. I'm so sorry. Um, and to be able to showcase that, especially on platforms like TikTok, like people just love that. <laughs> I just don't care what anyone has to say and um, just go with the flow and um, accepting myself for who I am was the greatest decision I ever made and it just keeps getting better and better and better. So I have recently become an ambassador for an organisation called The Good Human Factory, started by um, professional surfer Cooper Chapman. His main goal with um, The Good Human Factory is to just make people curious about mental health. I joined it because I believe in Cooper's messaging so much. I myself am such a huge mental health advocate. She's got this intelligence there that is very underestimated and yeah, mum and dad are very super proud of her.
I found myself, but I've also found my purpose. I know it sounds so cheesy, but I think it was all worth it. I'd say the main thing would be inspiring and empowering other people. I don't think I'll ever get used to that. It's something that still blows my mind today that people can take so much from me and my story. If you'd asked me a few years ago, I would have been <laughs> probably a bit annoyed or sad about it and I probably would have wanted to get another operation that was enabling me to smile. But now I'm so more than fine with it. Like I love not being able to smile, it's my superpower. So can you raise your eyebrows for me? Okay, that's good. Okay, now give me that smile as best you can. That's good, that's good. Isaac Hughes is unable to smile, no matter how hard he tries. The nine-year-old from Mould in Wales is one of just 200 people in the UK with Mebus syndrome a rare neurological disorder affecting the cranial nerves that causes facial paralysis. To us it's always been clear when Isaac's been happy or smiling and people make assumptions based on the fact that you know oh, obviously if you look like that then you must have cognitive issues and that's not the case and Isaac's a bright little boy. As a baby Isaac struggled with feeding and was diagnosed with Mebus syndrome at six months old. As he got older he was unable to develop speech and sign language was a challenge due to a lack of muscle tone and small hands, common symptoms of the syndrome. But that didn't stop Isaac making himself understood. Even though he couldn't speak, he found ways of telling his stories, he found ways of communicating that were so innovative. I mean, you know, if somebody put a mask on my face and then taped it up as well, I wouldn't be able to tell you a story, I wouldn't be able to communicate, but he could do that. and he. He was really good at doing that, wasn't he? Yeah, really good lateral thinking for really different ways of talking about things. Very, very clever at the way that he communicated the story and that was fantastic. It wasn't until he was seven years old that Isaac said his first words. If you'd have asked me two years ago if Isaac would ever talk, I would have said probably not. And it's only through really, really, really focused hard work that he's got to the point now where he can talk. Now happily settled at a mainstream school, Isaac's speech is progressing well. And I can usually make out what he says. And then I help him talk, like if he says it wrong, I help him pronounce it properly. And then I help play with him and stuff and help translate if somebody didn't understand him. What do you want to do when you're older, Isaac? Football, no. Why? Because I'm not that hard. Who do you want to play for then? Nestor. Well, are you good enough? Yes. Smile surgery is one of the options open to Isaac. He's come for a consultation with surgeon Adele E. Fatah, who is setting up the world's first centre for clinical excellence for Mebus at Older Hay Hospital. On the one hand, I can definitely see why parents would want to make the decision and have surgery early. It's for those who may have specific problems, such as bullying at school, um, wanting to get a job uh, where they're out um, in the public, on the other hand, there are other parents who think, well, I love my child the way they are, and if they want it doing, I will let them make that decision when they're older. The surgery is usually performed either by connecting the mouth to working muscles in the temple, or by implanting a small piece of another muscle, usually taken from the thigh. It's a huge operation, mm. a huge operation, so we're not sure whether we'll go down that route. It's not necessarily a natural smile because it's more of a mechanical smile. Being a parent's hard, but being a parent to a child with a rare condition where there isn't the general informational knowledge out there is that much harder. Keen not to rush into surgery yet, Kerry has set up a charity to help parents in a similar situation. In May last year I set up Saying But Different, which is an organisation that uses the arts to create awareness of the people behind disability. We concentrate on rare diseases and what we use is photography and try and capture the essence of the person. Although realistic about the struggles that Isaac will continue to face as he gets older, Kerry and Phil hope he will continue to live a happy life. Yeah, I suppose I just want Isaac to lead a normal life really and just do everything the same as everyone else really. Just be as normal as possible. He is going to have 
difficulties, but ultimately he is Isaac and I want him to be proud of that fact and proud of what he's been through and what he's achieved so far and what he'll carry on to achieve and just want him to be happy in his own skin and that's the most important thing. I have no facial expressions, so I can't smile at people, I can't move my face at all. I had four surgeries to be able to smile. I have always been obsessed with music when I have trouble expressing myself through a facial expression. Music is always such a powerful tool for that. Today I'm going to the studio with my producer Tyler to record my new single. The production's good, I think we're good. Sounds great to me. I was born with a rare syndrome called Mobius syndrome. That is where the six and seven cranial nerves are underdeveloped, making me born with facial paralysis. So basically, I cannot smile, I cannot move my eyebrows, um, I have no facial movements, and I had to have four surgeries just to be able to smile. And this is, this is my smile. I was diagnosed at one month old. The first three years of my life were very traumatic for me and my family. Just as I was in and out of the hospital, I had trouble eating, I had trouble breathing. I think the hardest part about having Mobius syndrome is the facial paralysis and connecting with people with the lack of facial expression. Being gay and disabled uh, and having that intersectionality definitely interferes with how I present and how I kind of educate others. Um, being disabled is hard enough, but having another layer of kind of minority and diversity definitely makes it a lot harder. So I met Nick on a dating app and I was just about to delete it and I just hit it off with him and I never thought it would be where we are now. So I actually found some photos Okay. when I was a baby and from my oh surgery. My Look at how small I was. That's you. That's me. That's a little bean. <laughs> the first surgery I had was, it was 10 years old. And I knew about it. I always knew about the surgery, but my mom was always wanted me to choose. But I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. And I couldn't like close my mouth. So that affected my speech. So with the surgery, they actually um, put fat or muscle in my lips so that I would be able to close my mouth. After my surgery, I was definitely able to communicate better and I think that's helped me with everything. When I first saw Austin on Tinder, I just thought he was like a cute guy and he was kind of just my type and I just like, I didn't even think about any like disability. I think he mentioned it in his bio, but I just thought he looked cute anyway. Is there anything like you regret about the surgeries? Are you just like, are you happy with everything you've done? No, I'm so happy that I got the surgery, especially because when I was younger, I just felt like I wanted to show that smile because when people are walking by, you know, you smile to them, and that's like an indicator that you're you're nice and friendly and in a good mood. And I was never able to do that, so I think the smiles were very just. I wanted to just show my smile that I had on the inside, and I think it just overall was the best thing that I could have done. I have always been obsessed with music. I have always listened to music and music has always been my therapy. When I have trouble expressing myself through a facial expression, music is always such a powerful tool for that. So when I'm writing my own songs, my music is undeniable for who I am, my message, and what my emotions can bring upon. So that's why I love recording and writing my own music and sharing myself through music. Today, I'm going to the studio with my producer, Tyler, to record my new single. Nice. I would say Austin's one of the most talented as far as just being able to play. Like, this song, like, we got a shot of him just playing it, like, literally on the fly. He's able to figure out chords and stuff, and, like, producing with him has always been really cool. It's been fun. Oh, no. 
I don't think Austin's condition affects his music at all. Vocally, his vocals sound like any other vocal I've mixed, and I feel like you wouldn't notice that he has a syndrome just hearing it off of his song. Still I, rise. I think my new single, Still I Rise, is going to be a new era for me. It's going to be trailblazing on new music and the importance of just a powerful message in music. My plans for the future is to have a huge social platform to influence other people and inspire the world. I hope to travel the world and get my name out there with my music and my story.